How's it going, everyone? Welcome to this very special Game Explained discussion. I'm Joey, and this is Mitchell from IGN. We both have one thing in common, and that is we reviewed Bayonetta 3 on the Nintendo Switch. And another thing we have in common is that we gave it a pretty solid review, I, I would say. Wouldn't you agree, Mitchell? Yeah, and you know what? I would say, you know, I, I don't know you very well, but I would I would assume we have <laughs> much more in common than just that. Uh, much more, <laughs> yes. <laughs> of course. Uh, but... But yeah, you gave the game a 9 out of 10. I gave it a liked a lot, which is like, I guess 8.5. Our, our, our rating scale is very unique, so mm -hmm. it's not like we have 10 ratings. So it's still a good rating, because above that is loved, and above that is mind-blowing. And very few games that game explain have gotten mind-blowing. But this is still a very solid game. I had a few problems with it, and I understand you had a few problems with it too. Let's kind of start with what I think has been a sort of common thing amongst us reviewers uh, who've played the game. Uh, we're kind of not too big on the story part of this game. It's definitely got the weakest story out of the trilogy, at least in our opinion. And a part of that comes from a number of things that I know people say, you don't play Bayonetta for the story. And I'm like, no, we do. Kind of. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, honestly, the, the story of Bayonetta needs to get a little more respect. I mean, it's not, look, it's no, it's no Last of Us. It's no... Right. You know, it's no Xenoblade, it's not an RPG, but, you know, there, there's a good amount of lore within the story of, of Bayonetta that's that's pretty interesting, you know, going back to the Umbran Witches and the Lumen Sages, the right and left eye of the world, and, you know, the history behind those things. Um, there was a lot of a lot of stuff built up in those first two games that really goes completely unaddressed in, in Bayonetta 3 to the point where, like, you know, on the one hand, it's good because it's a good entry point if you did not play one and two and you just want to get into it without having to, you know, watch a, a recap video. But at the same time, you know, it is the third game in a series and it's kind of a bummer that you just don't really get any callbacks from from those first two games. And also, I would say characters behave very differently in this game than they did in uh, the first two. They um, do. Yeah. And I feel like they don't behave at all sometimes. Yeah. Like, a lot of the characters we know and love, they get very little screen time here. Mm -hmm. There's not... The story just moves at such a breakneck speed to where you don't get very good character-driven moments here. It, despite there being no spoilers here, just to remind everyone, there's no spoilers. I put it in the title. No spoilers here. I know there's a lot of story stuff going around, but we're not going to get into that. Um, but even then, like, characters like Luca and Jean just get nothing. Even Bayonetta herself, like... Like, yeah, she gets thrown into these these situations all the time in Bayonetta 1 and 2, just like, oh, here's a... All of a sudden, I'm, like, I'm, like, going through space and time all of a sudden, but now... But it still felt like she went through character development in the mm. first two games by the very end. But here, it's like... I don't know. The journey doesn't really... The destination was wild, yes. I'm not going to say much about the ending, but it was a wild ending. But yeah, the destination didn't feel very... Uh, there wasn't a lot of development there. I felt yeah, like. yeah, I feel like Bayonetta feels very much just like a passenger as she goes yes. through like these these different you know multiverses. And there's story happening around her within those multiverses. But ultimately, none of the stuff... None of, none of those arcs really matter all that much in like the whole grand scheme of the, the story. Um, <laughs> what I do think, one thing that I will say is a positive are the character interactions. The, you know, the interactions between Bayonetta and the different, you know, multiverse versions of her, the interactions between her and uh, Viola, um, you know, it's, it's, it's strong stuff. And, and I think, you know, we get, we do get to see some sides of Bayonetta that we typically don't really see all that often um, in these games. You know, Bayonetta 2 is, in my opinion, the best Bayonetta has been because you, you really see that connection that she has with John, with mm -hmm. uh, Jean, and, you know, the, the lengths that she's willing to go to to save that friendship. Um, so it's not quite on that level, but, you know, we get to see, you know, a, a range of Bayonetta's emotions in this game that, you know, yeah. we, we haven't really seen all that often in, you know, the prior two. That's very true. She does get a bit vulnerable here, especially mm -hmm. near the end. No spoilers again. But yeah, uh, I totally get you there. And about Viola, I, I know you were quite fond of her in your yeah. review. I was the opposite. Oh, <laughs> like, no. I know. It's, it's, <laughs> She's so we, dorky and lovable. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. I guess I just am not a fan of that character type. I thought she, like her 
I, the voice direction the actor was given, um, I felt like was like yeah, she, this was definitely her direction being given. But I felt like uh, anything anything coming out of her mouth, I was just like, stop talking, please. <laughs> and you know, the comments disagreed with me about her too, because it, it, to be fair, she is like she's the polar opposite of Bayonetta. She's not sure of herself. She is an Umbran witch in training, and I totally get that. But I also felt like her dialogue and her moments were just a bit too corny, even by Bayonetta standards. Like, sure. the part where it, she's running away with her pants on fire. Oh I was just my like, god, I love it. Really? <laughs> and I totally get why people would love it, because it is like, you know, it's a, it's an Enzo kind of moment, you know? You'd think yeah. Enzo would get his pants lit on fire, but no, yeah. it's Viola instead. Even then, though, Viola has the best battle theme ever. It's pretty my good. Goodness. It's I will yeah. <laughs> I will say though I I do love that battle theme but it's also the ba the same battle theme that's typically used in her like secret missions and you replay those so often because they're hard and you know you're constantly retrying them and so you know I I like the song there were moments where I was just like please just shut up for a second and let me focus <laughs> on on beating this mission that I've been stuck on for the last 15 minutes <laughs> yeah I totally got frustrated too like I didn't I didn't really do the secret missions that much near the end. I was focused on beating it um, by that time. But yeah. yeah, I totally get that. But speaking of missions, let's talk about Jean's side chapters. Because uh -huh. those were interesting. And I, I was thinking, these these are, these are feel like Metal Gear Solid-like parodies, but they're not because it's 2D. And that's when the comments came in and said, it's called elevator action, Joey. <laughs> like, like, come on. <laughs> but yeah, I was a bit mixed on these because I felt like they kind of... As, as cool little novelties as they are, I've, I've honestly felt like they kind of got in the way of the pacing a bit. Sure. Wouldn't, would you agree, or are you a bit more on the positive side of them? I, I would say I'm a, I'm a bit more on the positive side. Um, you know, for me, I you know, I didn't really play it like a stealth game. It's so right. forgiving. It's so forgiving <laughs> yeah. that, like, you know, you don't really need to, to uh, you know, take it slow or, you know, right. hide and vent as the, the game sometimes wants you to, to do. You could do that. But, uh, you know, it's so forgiving. You have so much life and there's so many health recovery uh, pickups that uh, I kind of just, you know, <laughs> I would bl blaze through it and try to get to yeah. where, I need, where I needed to go. And that way, you know, it, it, it allowed me to play like that. It allowed me to be, you know, it, it allowed me to go through it with a fast pace. Um, it's very forgiving in terms of, like, your stealth attack on, on enemies. Like, even if they're looking at you, if you can do the attack quick enough, you'll still be able to take them out in one hit. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I think more, more so, and I say this in the review, more so than, uh, the previous Bayonetta games, I really liked all the, the little interstitial moments in this, this Jean side mission stuff included, um, because of the fact that, you know, they're so varied there, there's so many different looks that this game gives outside of just, you know, standard platinum combat. Right. And, uh, yeah, I, I. I was a I wouldn't say I was a huge fan, but right. I I liked I liked the the breakup in the uh, you know the action so to speak. Yeah, it's very Bayonetta. Like the, this was definitely like um, it's kind of like in Bayonetta two where you'd have those those flight sh shooting missions. Yes, Same with Bayonetta yeah, I one don't had that I don't too. like those. <laughs> you don't like those? Well, <laughs> not I'm, a fan. Yeah, <laughs> fair, fair. But I was just thinking it's it is very much like they do like to change things up gameplay wise. Um, but uh, you, you know, it, it kind of felt a little Suda Fifty One to me too. Yeah, <laughs> it definitely yeah. does. It definitely I'm, has that Suda feel, mm -hmm. especially because there's like you know, there's pinup posters uh, <laughs> that you can like you know pose with. There's like little shower shower stalls that you can go into, and like there's a dude that walks in, and then you throw them against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> That's so crazy. We did a YouTube short about that, and for some reason, people love it so much. Not for some yeah. reason. It's obvious why, but, you know. <laughs> that was some fun stuff, and overall, Bayonetta 3 is a very fun game, in spite of, like, the qualms we have with the story, because I did remember like, just beating this game, I felt like I had to really think about how I felt about it, because I did feel like the story, the story stuff really kind of soured me a little bit at first, but, you know, mm -hmm. I played some more of it, too, and this is definitely more of a game I'd love to revisit again and again Bayonetta 3 the way I revisit Bayonetta 1 and 2 because the combat is still just as good if not better than Bayonetta's 1 and 2 and that's due to in part to two things to me is one the demon slave ability because as much as I think they could have been a little less they could have been a little less of them because they do feel overpowered at times 
I still felt like it was a solid concept that could use some refinement in future titles, maybe with the camera and maybe with like how often it's used, but it's still like a really epic ability and something that was totally a scale bound lives, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, it's so it's so funny you mentioned that in in your review uh, about the scalebound thing because I didn't make that connection, but I think you're absolutely right. I think this is like Kamiya letting scalebound live in like ideas that he wanted to use in scalebound and letting them live in a different form, um, right? Because it it, do, it really does have that feel. You are like controlling this massive beast that is just so powerful um, that they have to literally put enemies in that it just doesn't work on in order to kind of balance it. Um, And there's also, you know, enemies that will, they have moves that uh, are specifically designed kind of to, to like trigger its rage mode. Um, And, you know, you you have to, if you don't know about that, then it's going to happen to you and it's going to be a real bad time because once, once your, your summon goes into rage mode, it's, it's, they're like the hardest enemies in the game to deal with. It's game over. (laughs) It's game over, man. Yeah. You're going to have a bad time, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and speaking of Scalebound, I believe the gameplay director of Scalebound was also the gameplay director for this. Too. Okay, so yeah, it makes like, sense. Yeah, you know, let the, it, also just bring back Scalebound. Just a little side note, just do it, Xbox, come on. But, <laughs> but um, and the second thing that I really think makes Bayonetta 3's gameplay stand out among the rest of them are the weapons, and I just, I absolutely love that the weapons just change everything about the way Bayonetta plays, down to... Fr- down to her, the way she just moves. Like, the Ignis Arana yo-yo. Oh. Like, it makes her skate. It gives her skates, dude. <laughs> and Which, it turns her into a spider. I mean, like, skates, come on. Skates were a weapon, I believe, in the first Bayonetta. You had, like, little ice skates that you could use. Um, mm-hmm. So it kind of brought back memories of that. Um, but yeah, I, I love the, the yo-yos. I love I love that every weapon you equip changes the way you, you move through the environment. So, like, if you're using the yo-yos, you skate, you skate. If you're using the train, you turn into a train. Yes. Um, if you're using the spider, you can do little spider swings. Um, it's just there. There's so many cool little little aspects in this game, and when you combine those little bits with the amount of different weapons and demons that you you eventually get to control, um, it just it adds up to something that I think is is kind of magical. It really is. And I was never fond of changing my weapons in Bayonetta's 1 and 2. I might be in the minority there, but I just felt like the default ones worked just fine to me. And I don't know, I just wasn't a huge fan of just the swords and the whip. I was like, oh, okay, whatever. But yeah. then but then this game comes in is just like, I really felt like having fun with all kinds of the weapon types. I still wasn't a fan of most of them. Wasn't big on the, the, tra- the train, chainsaw, that kind mm-hmm. of thing, even though it is super cool. But it was, I, the yo-yo was my favorite weapon, hands yeah. down. I don't know if I can play anything else. <laughs> but but see, that's what I love so much about it, because, you know, not every weapon is going to appeal to every person, but I think the fact that it has that variety and, you know, you're able to jump into a new weapon and kind of, you know, test it out for yourself and, like, check out its moves and see how it feels. And you're not, you're not forced to use any of these weapons, really. You could get through the whole game pretty much just using the pistols because they yep. are you know they're iconic and they're a really good weapon but you know i i love having that freedom and creativity and just like the tools to to you know to play in the sandbox of combat that is bayonetta 3's uh you know system um mm-hmm. one of the things that i i is a pet peeve of mine in a lot of action games is when you have kind of like this lock and key thing with the weapons where you can only use this weapon to beat this enemy you can only Mm -hmm. use this weapon to beat this enemy you have to switch between them it's like yeah but i i kind of want to just be able to use the weapons i want to (laughs) use yeah give me that freedom of choice man yeah (laughs) and and, you know that's that's one of the things that bayonetta is really really good at it's one of the things that devil may cry is really good at too and um you know i think they are very much on the same wave, wavelength when it comes to their their combat and their philosophy around combat. And Man, it's just my so friend good. got me a copy of D- DMC Five. I, I need to put it in. I haven't. Oh my yet. god, <laughs> Joey, stop this! Stop this recording right, All right now. Go play Devil May Cry Five. I'll wait for you. <laughs> okay, give me one second. Here. <laughs> but no, I definitely got to jump into that. I was I played DMC Three. I never beat it, but I wasn't a. He- I'm, I much prefer the combat of Bayonetta, um, sure. and that's probably because it's easier than Devil May Cry, but yeah, 
Yeah, I still want to jump into DMC5. But before we get sidetracked there, the final thing I do want to talk about, and that was, this was another thing I was surprised we kind of like, like, like agreed on in our reviews was like the homunculi. As cool as they looked and as as cool as their concepts were, they kind of underdelivered um, here, and that kind of ties back to the story too. Just how the story could have been better. There, I really felt like this ha this enemy had so much potential to be something so interesting and so threatening too. And that they, it started out that way in the beginning. Like here's the here are these. Not only are these creatures wiping out universes, these are creatures made by humans. The fact that humans made something so, like, powerful and evil is so interesting. It's not like angels or demons. It's just like, yeah, we know where they come from. We, like, thousands of years old, right? Mm -hmm. Something brand new here, something so cool. And, like, they barely ever explore their origins or, like, where, like why they were made. Like, who made them. Yeah, we know. We They give, like, very brief summary. But then it was just like, no, I want to know more, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of nailed it. Um, this was actually, like, my biggest disappointment with the story because of the fact that, you know, yeah, you don't really need to explain angels and demons in, in Bayonetta 1 and 2. Like, we, we get where they're from. But if you're going to tell me that these monstrosities that are literally destroying the world are man-made, and then you don't tell me you know anything about the reason they're they're made for or you know the what how they were made where they were made uh you know the the progression of the villain to get to the point where he's making these things and trying to you know destroy the the multiverse the multiverse or whatever uh that's a problem um mm -hmm. it's it, it it eliminates a lot of my investment in what's happening in the story when i don't get those answers Right. Um, so yeah, but what I will say is that the design of them and like just the, the overall, what they bring to the table in terms of combat is really, really good. And, and it's, it's even more impressive when you think about just how many times Platinum Games has done this already. They've created entire like bestiaries, be bestiaries. I don't know yeah, how to bestiaries. pronounce that word. <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've, yeah. they've created like, you know, two entire bestiaries for both angels and, and demons. And then, you know, they did it again with the homunculus. So like the fact that they're able to create so many different enemy types and have them all be so interesting and so challenging to deal with. is just like, you know, I don't know how they do it. They're, they're they really are, you know, the, the top of the class when it comes to the style of game. They seriously are. And, you know, to anyone listening, if if you have any, like, worries from what we're talking about with the qualms we have with the story, like, if you're a Bayonetta fan, you're gonna love Bayonetta 3. I don't know if it'll be your favorite in the series. There's some people I think they've said, like, it is their favorite, other reviewers. But it's still really good. It still continues the trend of just creating some of the best action in gaming, period. And you're going to have a great time with it. But, you know, Mitchell, I think it's time for a new Nintendo console. That's all I got to say. <laughs> I think I think it's time. I think, uh, you know, we, we're, we're definitely reaching that point where um, game developers are trying to, to push it so far to the limit that it's affecting, you know, the playability of, of some of these games. And... In the grand scheme of things, Bayonetta's performance issues are not that bad. Right. Even even when it's at its worst, which I would say is probably at the begin, like the first couple chapters of the game, um, you know, it's it's still fully playable, fully enjoyable. My my issue was going from that and then immediately picking up Bayonetta two and being like, man, this <laughs> is super smooth. It still looks beautiful. And, you know, I, I would I would say that even, like, the environments in Bayonetta 2 are more impressive looking than, than the environments in Bayonetta 3. 100%, yes. <laughs> and so, like, I'm like, what happened then? <laughs> like, why, <laughs> why does Bayonetta 3 look so much worse than Bayonetta 2, which was a Wii U game? And, you know, the Switch obviously, you know, did some visual enhancements of it, but I remember it looking very good on Wii U as well. Yeah, um, yeah the strike, yeah, the art style in 3 is not as striking as 2. And, like, performance issues aside, 2, I think, just looks like a better game. I know there's people that d disagree with me on that, but, like, wait until you, you get the game for yourself, and then we'll talk. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, but you know, the action's still great. Bayonetta 3, still a great game. We still gave it glowing reviews. So definitely check the game out when it comes out on October 28th. But thank you so much for joining me, Mitchell. Is there, where can we find you? Let us know. Uh, you can find me at a little website called IGN.com. And you can find me on Twitter at Jurassic Rabbit. I heard a few things about that little indie website. I'm going to have to check it out. <laughs> All right, but uh, thank you all so much for this review discussion here about Bayonetta 3. Uh, let us know in the comments if you plan on picking it up. But until next time, bye-bye.